Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You could go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the screen. Uh, you can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. Uh, however, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, uh, please use the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A for the benefit of those on the phone. I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back to the CSI website once the webinar is posted. The go to webinar button will take you to the uh, YouTube link. Uh, with that said, I will now introduce uh, the presenters for today's presentation. Uh, Nakia Grayson is an information technology security specialist, project manager who leads the supply chain assurance and autonomous vehicle cybersecurity project efforts at NCOE, uh, which is part of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Also, we have Chris Brown, who is a principal cybersecurity engineer at the MITRE Corporation. Um, with that said, uh, guys, please take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Philip. I'm going to start to uh, share my screen. Just let me know if you can see it. Yep, we can see that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, we, we, we would like to thank you, Philip, and the uh, CSI Act team for inviting us here this afternoon to talk about our validating the integrity of computing devices project. We are excited to share our work. Um, uh, so here for the agenda, we will uh, give an introduction and an overview of our national cyber security center of excellence. Uh, we will talk about our project uh, that we did for the validating and integrity of uh, computing devices. We will um, share about our reference architecture, go over our project scenarios, and then also mention our industry collaboration and uh, go over our 1800 series publication. After we finish that, we will uh, uh, finish our, pre uh, wrap up our uh, presentation and then leave time for a, uh, for you all to access any information. Uh, so, who are we? Uh, so, at the NCCOE, uh, we bring uh, experts together from the in in industry, government, 
and academia to address the real world problems of securing complex IT systems and protecting the nation's uh, 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 critical infrastructure. Uh, we were formed in partnership with the state of Maryland and Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, and we help uh, uh, en enterprises, no matter the size, law, large, medium, small, to manage their cyber risk. Uh, we, we really work to integrate standards, uh, best practices, and a, a commercially valuable technology into example reference architectures or uh, demonstrations that can really be able to help address uh, specific cyber uh, challenges. Uh, and by providing these examples, uh, we help to uh, uh, reduce the technology, economic, and educational barriers to adoption of occurring technologies. Uh, we were established in 2012 as a applied cyber lab uh, at NIST. And in fact, uh, we are a part of the applied cyber security division, which is under our NIST information technology laboratory. Uh, and we operate in, uh, in a close collaboration with, uh, with various other NIST experts and uh, programs. Uh, NIS, um, you know, uh, we are uh, definitely want to point out uh, that we are a non-regulatory federal agency, so all our guidance is uh, voluntary. Uh, and 2018 uh, is when NIS uh, spons sponsored the uh, nation's first uh, federally funded research and development center, which is dedicated to cyber. Uh, so this FFRDC is operated by MITRE as a, a trusted partner with NIST. Um, they provide technology and engineering expertise and support of our uh, mission and as well as NIST and the rest of the federal government. Our um, building is in Rockville, Maryland, and we are the home to more than like 20 uh, labs. Uh, so here, just getting some more into detail, kind of touched on this already, but again, just mentioned that we were established in 2012 and our uh, cyber uh, laboratory is in Rockville, Maryland, and it's underneath of our information technology uh, laboratory. Uh, so what we do, uh, so what makes us uh, different is really our uh, hands-on nature of our work and our uh, close partnership with like the public and the cyber technology uh, sector. Our, our work at the, uh, uh, we uh, combine existing standards and best practices with a commercially available technology to be able to show users the how of cyber. Uh, so really giving them like a roadmap that they can use to be able to adapt and use to uh, so they can start to try to figure out ways on how they can address cyber risk on, on their own in their uh, environment. So here, I'm uh, going to go more into detail about our validating integrity uh, project. Uh, so for most of our projects at the center, we uh, first come up with what is the cyber challenge that we are trying to solve. So we normally will have a lot of different like uh, stakeholders. Uh, that we will meet with to come up with, like, what are some of the top challenges and uh, that's affecting them. So for our project, it focused on uh, like the hardware of a supply chain. Uh, we understood that a lot of, like, enterprises uh, face a lot of different uh, challenges of trying to be able to identify trustworthy products due to the increased risk uh, uh, that can re result from a, a, a compromises and like cyber uh, supply chain. So some of the problems, like as you see here on the uh, on the slide, that can occur is like sometimes um, some some folks may be faced with a counterfeit product, uh, substituted uh, components, malware in the system, firmware and software, and uh, may have some trouble uh, being able to uh, account for uh, like 
uh, different like products and services in their uh, supply chain. So here next, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chris Brown to talk more about our uh, project solution. Chris. Thanks, Nakia. Uh, yeah, so I am Chris Brown. Uh, I am from the MITRE Corporation. And as Nikia already mentioned, we are the FFRDC that NIST sponsors. And uh, this section of the presentation, we're going to kind of go through some of the more technical uh, aspects of this project and demonstration that we put together. Um, so my role on this project was uh, the technical lead. So I worked with our commercial partners. Uh, to bring their technology in the lab and work with them to uh, integrate their technologies and put this demonstration together. Um, and so, as Nakia mentioned, you know, the overall uh, the overall goal of this project was is to help organizations verify that their internal components of their computing devices are accurate and uh, that they acquire are genuine and haven't been tampered with. And so. Uh, to fulfill that goal, we put together three different scenarios that we wanted to demonstrate using real commercial technologies, and we'll kind of talk about that. Um, the first scenario uh, is the creation of manufacturing artifacts, and these are the um, these are cryptographic signed digital artifacts that come from manufacturers and subcomponent manufacturers. Um, that are embedded on the computing device. And when I say computing device, I am talking about um, uh, laptops and servers within this context. And they embed those artifacts that can be verified later by relying organizations. And we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, in the second scenario, um, once the uh, once the acquiring organization you know purchases these computing devices and brings them into their own organization, um, they want to put them through some sort of a test acceptance testing, and we integrated um, the verification of the components during that acceptance, acceptance testing uh, in that scenario. And in scenario three, uh, we wanted to continue to verify the integrity of the computing device while they are out in the field and in use, so after they've been uh, provisioned to the end user. And so uh, through all of this, you know, it's important to address you know, all levels of the of the supply chain, you know, from the manufacturer all the way to the end user. And that's what these three scenarios try to cover. Um, so in, in the in the upcoming slides, you know, I'll talk about some of the commercial technologies that we work with um, throughout this throughout this project. So uh, in this slide. You'll see our notional architecture and the different uh, collaborating vendors that we worked with. And uh, just starting from the top, you know, you'll see some familiar um, uh, companies probably to, to most of you. Uh, so in, in that top row there, these are the components or subsystems uh, that are contained within computing devices. So we work with Seagate with their uh, hard drives. And uh, Intel, obviously, uh, their, their processors are able, they have cryptographic uh, signature uh, manufacturing artifacts that we were able to validate within, uh, within uh, systems, which is that second row there. Uh, so we work with OEM laptop and server vendors from uh, HP Enterprise, uh, Dell Technology uh, laptops and servers, and uh, HP Inc. Um, laptops. And we use those. Uh, as our test demonstration systems within our demonstration. And um, on that bottom row, you see some, um, uh, the companies that we work with that, uh, that we work with that you may already have in your organization that you can integrate the supply chain verification processes with. Um, so we work with IBM with their SIM product, uh, Eclipsium, uh, which does some runtime integrity uh, detection and Archer, which is a uh, governance and risk platform. And we'll kind of get into those as we move along here. Next slide. Uh, so this is the overall project architecture that we put, to, put together, uh, kind of a systems level view of our architecture. And uh, with this, you know, we wanted to emulate uh, a typical enterprise. So, uh, You'll see in the upper right hand corner in the, the greenish box there, those represent our enterprise computing devices that we wanted to validate. Uh, and so you'll see the, uh, the names of the different uh, manufacturers there. And so those represent the, uh, 
the computing devices that have been issued to your enterprise end, end users. Uh, moving below that to the bluish box, um, these represent the enterprise services that you may already have in your um, uh, in your environment that we um, integrated our solution into. Uh, so you see Archer there for the integrated risk management uh, functionality that you may already have in your organization. Uh, Microsoft, they have a configuration management system. Uh, we we integrated that into our processes. Uh, below that, uh, we also work with an open source platform um, that is sponsored by the National Security Agency uh, called HERS ACA, and that's a platform validation system. And uh, below that, IBM, as I mentioned before, uh, we use their SIM uh, to get some of the runtime uh, integrity information from there. And on the on the left there, uh, you'll see some of the uh, the cloud services that we work with to put this demonstration together. So Eclipsium, um, which is a firmware analytics uh, platform, and below that in Intel, uh, which uh, has some supporting components for their uh, trusted uh, computing program. Uh, next slide. So we've talked a bit about scenario one, which is when manufacturers create these artifacts that are supposed to be later validated by uh, a relying organization. So getting more into scenario two, uh, this is when we wanted to demonstrate, you know, when the, um, when, when, when the, um, I'm sorry, the, there you go. When the delivery of the computing device comes, uh, comes off the loading dock into an organization, um, what do you do when that acceptance testing process? Uh, so I mentioned before, most organizations have some acceptance testing process for their laptops and uh, servers when they you know, configure them with uh, networking information, uh, do, do other things. So we wanted to integrate the, um, uh, the supply chain uh, validation testings into that existing process. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. So the first um, the first problem is, you know, how do we extract that um, artifact that we get from the manufacturer uh, from the computer um, into uh, something that is usable and that we can validate? Uh, so this diagram kind of represents how we did that. And uh, I won't go into a lot of detail here, but uh, basically, we set up a system where the computing device uh, that's just been delivered, so the laptop or server, is configured to uh, boot over the network uh, via the network interface card. And uh, we set up two uh, ephemeral uh, operating system environments that's uh, dynamically loaded onto the computing device, um, one, uh, one using Linux, one using uh, uh, Windows PE uh, uh, operating system. And those uh, contain the validation tools that we need uh, to be able to provision uh, the computer once it comes into the organization. Uh, so that this is what this uh, this diagram represents that environment. Next slide. And so um, once the computing device has been um, loaded into that ephemeral environment, it's extracted that uh, cryptographic artifact from the from the computing device. Uh, we need uh, ways to be able to validate that artifact. And so uh, here's one approach that we did with with some of our computer computing devices where uh, this is representing the um, the HERS uh, NSA uh, solution. This follows the trusted computing groups uh, standard for um, uh, platform certificates. Uh, so basically what, what happens here is that um, what's called a provisioner is uh, loaded onto the computing device. It scans the computing device for all the components uh, that are on there. And uh, that information is sent back to a central uh, certificate, uh, certificate uh, authority. And, uh, it's, uh, com and that scan is compared to the, um, to the cryptographic artifact that came from the manufacturer. And the... Uh, and uh, so it checks to see if those things align and if they do, and if it's able to uh, validate the digital signature, 
on that uh, on that artifact, which uh, comes from a certificate from the manufacturer, then it passes the acceptance testing. Next slide. Okay, and so this slide represents, um, you know, what happens. So we're going to get platform manifests from different manufacturers um, in different formats. And so how do we uh, normalize all of that information into something that's consumable uh, in, uh, so that we can integrate that into our um, risk management platform? So we have a dashboard for it of sorts so we can see um, all of our computing devices from, uh, from, one, from one pane of glass. And so what we did uh, was come up with something called the platform manifest correlation system. And so that's what you see in the brown box there. And basically what this does is just a bit of code that we take um, the different uh, platform manifests that we get from each computing device and translate that into one normalized format. Um, so yeah, this, this code uh, that we developed is also, uh, we published that with um, our other artifacts for this project, and that's available on GitHub if anyone wants to take a look at it and modify it or um, supply any feedback. Um, yeah, next slide. And so once all of that information has been normalized, it's fed into this risk management platform. And this is a screenshot from that. And this is a representative example of an individual computing device that has been uh, provisioned um, using uh, the Intel TSC platform. And you see in, in, the, in the top portion, you'll see all the baseline data that we're able to gather from all the uh, all the computing devices in our organization. So that's you know the manufacturer, the serial number, serial number, the platform number, things like that. And the box below where it says associated components, those are the components that were scanned within the uh, computing device itself. And you see there, uh, it also has some of those Seagate drives, uh, hard drives that we talked about earlier, which also have a uh, artifact associated with that. Uh, so this gives the um, uh, the operator a heads up view of all the components that are uh, associated with each computing device within the organization. A very a very detailed uh, view. Next slide. And so um, once that process is done, it's past that acceptance testing. You know all the the um, the scan components from that computing device aligns with the manufacturer's um, uh, artifact. Then we move on to scenario three. Um, so scenario three is verification of the components during use. So this is uh, when the computing device has been fielded to the end user. Um, so this scenario is kind of revolves around the threat of someone you know, leaving your laptop at a coffee shop or something like that, and someone's swapping out a component, uh, something of that nature. And so we wanted to be able to protect against that um, because the life cycle doesn't end just when the acceptance testing happens. Um, next slide. And so uh, this is one of the solutions, this represents this, uh, one of the solutions that we use to uh, monitor the computing devices while they're in operational use. This is uh, with our Eclipsium uh, partner who uh, who hosts a, a cloud service. And so uh, what happens here from the top, there is a scanner that uh, gets install installed on each laptop computing device. And this uh, does an ongoing configurable scan while the computing device is fielded. Uh, that information is fed up to Eclipsium's analysis back in. Um, so they have a, uh, a vast library of information from different computing devices that they're able to make uh, sort of computational um, uh, predictions about. And uh, they focus on um, the integrity in, of, of firmware, um, you know, from, from an operational point of, point of view. Um, so that's all, all that information is fed into the analysis back in. Uh, and then we took that, some of that information out and fed it into our uh, risk management platform dashboard, so the enterprise operator has a uh, has a view of that. 
And so we'll we'll kind of talk about that as well. Next slide. And so what you see here is a view of the Eclipsium dashboard. Um, you could you kind of see it has uh, a dashboard of its own and it kind of monitor, monitors the integrity and risk factors involved with all the monitored uh, computing devices that we've installed their client on. Um, but we wanted to uh, kind of pull some of that information uh, back into our risk management platform. And so they have an available API, uh, which we were able to correlate uh, the data from Eclipsium uh, back into our enterprise risk management platform. Um, and so we developed clo code to be able to do that. Um, that code is also available on our on our GitHub page. And so uh, people can download that and take take a look at it if they if they want. Um, so in the next uh, slide, you can go to the next slide. We'll see, uh, this is what it looks like after we've pulled that information from Eclipsium uh, using their API. Uh, we are able to pull in the, the firmware uh, date and version of the computing device. Um, and uh, you see in this case that some sort of integrity issue is detected and that the administrator should take some sort of, some sort of action. Maybe the uh, the firmware is is out of date or has been um, uh, corrupted. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And so, uh, an additional point in uh, scenario three, we wanted to come up with a capability to create um, an incident tracking record. When our SIM detects a platform integrity security event um, for the operator uh, incident response team. And so uh, that's what's represented here. And so each record is associated with uh, a computing device. So in this uh, example incident, Archer has uh, reported a security of the event or, or an offense from the SIM, uh, which is an HP Inc. Uh, laptop that we had in our lab. Uh, if you click on that incident ID, it reveals more details about the incident um, for the personnel assigned to investigate the, the incident uh, for additional additional context. Um, the incident summary can provide a set of remedi remediation actions for the security personnel. So in this example, the analyst has been recommended that the, um, that the incident response personnel remove the computing device uh, from the environment and unplug it from the, from the network. Other, uh, remediation actions could relate to the platform integrity events could also include, um, replacing a system component or updating, updating or changing the firmware configuration, uh, executing manufacturer specific platform recovery capabilities, um, uh, and other resiliency, um, best practices. Uh, so that's, uh, so, so the, the the point of this was to just to have uh, 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 an remediation action uh, available for the security operators to be able to take action once something uh, is detected during operational use. And I think at this point, um, I'm going to hand it back to Nakia. Thanks so much, Chris. So here, everybody just wanted to, you know, go through like our approach when we are first like starting one of these uh, like projects. Um, so here is like uh, is our kind of like our foundation of trust, uh, which was like built on open and uh, transparent uh, processes. Uh, so we really work to like build trust with our stakeholders, uh, and to really establish that trust. Trust we need to like verify and like kind of like try things out, and then also document our work uh, and this is what we really like do here um and so again uh you know chris already you know talked about all the the, the various like tools and technology that we use so when we first start coming up with a project we define the scope of work uh with like you all uh, uh our subject matter experts to be able to come up with a, a project to be, uh, and then focus on how we can solve that uh cyber challenge and then um, two, as you uh, see the assemble, we uh, work to assemble a team of in, in, in industry, uh, government agencies and acad 
academia to be able to address all aspects of the cyber uh, challenge. And then we uh, built. So we, uh, you know, get all the different uh, the technology in our uh, laboratory. And then we start to build out a practical uh, and repeatable uh, like uh, laboratory to be able to address that uh, cyber challenge. So those three uh, steps that I just mentioned, those are normally like our our three uh, main uh, uh, phases uh, of our project. And when we do uh, like look for different uh, vendors, what we do is we put out a federal registered notice, uh, and then a a interested vendor will have to uh, send us a letter of interest to express on how they can uh, help us meet uh, and address the cyber challenge. And then we will normally uh, adjudicate those letters of interest. And they are on a first come first serve uh, basis. And we will uh, then we'll, once we do that, then we we'll, like do we we'll assemble the team and do like a kickoff. But on the uh, left side is uh, the, the a few other phases that we, we go through, uh, which is we will collaborate with like the uh, public to get uh, feedback where we're building out our uh, laboratory and then putting out guidance. And so throughout this process, we are uh, documenting our progress. Uh, we are uh, like seeking feedback and then also collaborating with the public uh, to able to be able to like share our work. And then we also advocate and uh, educate. So we share uh, like the work that we're uh, working on uh, and really hopes to help to improve like, you know, cyber uh, posture for uh, different environments. So here is our project ex execution uh, timeline. So this is what uh, kind of like we, we did, uh, and this is like a very, uh, like uh, uh, like a broad level look out at our uh, project where, again, we had worked on this project, as you see from the timeline at the bottom, we, uh, it did take us some time uh, to get started. And so overall, you could say that this took some time to uh, get uh, from start to finish, uh, but, you know, it, since we had a lot of partnership with the public, um, then again, what we did was engage with the public to be able to uh, scope our work. Uh, and then we second, we formed our team and built the uh, community of interest. Uh, and then we had uh, sent out a federal register notice. We had vendors submit a letter of interest, and 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 all the vendors that uh, that we had chose to come on our team, they did have to sign uh, a crater, uh, basically just like stating that they were okay with giving us their. Uh, using their technology and tools for our project. Uh, and then we uh, work to uh, come up with our, uh, our architecture. So we design our architecture, then we had built the built plan for that. And then we end up start going into the laboratory to build out our uh, functional test. And then we work towards uh, documenting our work, which we normally do in a special public Education 1800 series, uh, and then the the last phase it, it is outreach. So so similar to what we're doing right now is promoting our work. Uh, we normally will go to several different events to share the work that we do to like uh, seek ongoing feedback. And then also here, you know, if anybody has uh, like used our work and how it's benefit them. Here, as I touched on this, as, as, uh, as this is what we, how we uh, document our work. So we d document all the work that we did in this laboratory in a special publication, 1800 series. And this uh, comprises of three different uh, volumes. So as you see here, volume A is the why we wrote this guide and, and our approach to solving the uh, the challenge. So this is at a uh, at a very high level. Uh, typically, it's like one to two pages, and it will typically be ge be more geared geared to like the executive like leadership. 
Uh, and then volume B is the what we built and why. So it goes into the risk analysis. And then like we have various uh, mappings to uh, like the cyber security framework and then and then a few other NIST standards. And, and this is more geared to the uh, technology or uh, security project manager. And then the volume C is a how to build. Uh, it, it will include uh, example implementation. So including all the details um, on on how we built out our work, uh, and it goes in step by step uh, instructions. So if you wanted to uh, replicate anything that we did in our project, uh, you will use the, this guide to do so. And this is more so geared to the IT uh, the IT professional that's going to do the hands on uh, built out inside the uh, laboratory. Uh, here, I, I, as I mentioned, so our work, uh, it it uh, resulted in a publication, uh, SP 1800 series dash 34, uh, and we published this in d December of 2022, uh, and our final uh, volume, A, B, and C, it, it includes the laptop and server built. Um, and so I guess one thing here that we, we wanted to just point out is that we always, while we're uh, finished with this project, we always still encourage like adoption uh, and welcome feedback on our, our work and then and any uh, new ideas as well. So here is a few key takeaways. So we had a lot of different vendors uh, that like that Chris had uh, went over uh, that had uh, gave us uh, different tools and technology to help us build out our uh, laboratory and to be able to uh, demonstrate on how uh, the cyber challenge can be addressed. So these are some key uh, takeaways from them. Uh, not going to just like, you know, just going to uh, paraphrase a bit, but just like from like it, it, Intel, I know they mentioned that, you know, overall it was a great uh, working on, on this project. Uh, they felt that you know it, it it was a great uh learning experience to uh be able to you know work with other vendors uh on like device annotation uh and then we have like Dell um uh, they you know just mentioned like they highlighted the, the need that it was great to be able to uh standardize um supply chain amongst very different uh, partners uh and be able to uh, expand their already existing uh, partnership. Uh, so here, I just wanted to like touch on some uh, additional uh, resources that uh, we have at NIST that will be, you know, very, very great for you all to know. So here on that first bullet is a cyber uh, security framework 2.0 uh, quick start guide for a uh, Cyber supply chain uh, risk management, and this really helps a enterprise to be able to improve their uh, C scrum uh, processes as well as to become a like smarter um, like a, a, a purchaser and uh, and supplier of technology products and services. And it focuses on two ways that could, uh, that the cyber security framework can help. Uh, with using the uh, new uh, uh, supply chain a, a, a catalog uh, to be able to establish and 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 operate a C scrum a, a capability, and then secondly, be able to define and a, a communicate a supplier's requirements using the uh, cyber security framework. So again, this quick start, it really helps to be able to use that uh, supply chain a, a, a category that's in the CSF 2.0. And then the second bullet, it, it is the NIST uh, Special Publication SP 800-161-1. Uh, and this really is a guidance that can help uh, to be able to identify, assess, and mitigate cyber risk throughout the uh, supply chain at all levels uh, of your uh, business. And then the third bullet uh, is a, um, a NIST supply chain risk management fact sheet, and it touches really broadly on the NIST work in this area. So 
it, it includes our uh, our scope, our approach, uh, key NIST uh, resources, and our and any uh, activities. So this uh, fact sheet it, it includes some of the uh, like standards uh, that I haven't already mentioned. So uh, it, it will be a great you know document to like check out. And then the fourth bullet is uh, a pointer to our uh, another project that is running out of our uh, cyber center. Uh, software supply chain DevOps, uh, and that project is like looking at uh, multiple proof of concepts uh, that can involve different technologies, program languages, and in various uh, sectors. So the next uh, slide, I'm just going to uh, kind of briefly touch on how uh, you all can uh, get involved. So there are many ways. Uh, to get involved with the work that we do, uh, as you see on the right screen, you can join a, a community of interest. Uh, so for this project, as I mentioned, this one is like we have pretty much final this project, finished this project. But we always encourage, um, you know, folks to uh, uh, send us ideas for like new projects. Uh, we happy to talk to any about about like any challenges that you face. Uh, you can uh, give us feedback on our, any of our public uh, occasions, uh, and then you can also like seek to participate in a, a project. And again, as I mentioned, like share a project idea. And we do have various uh, community uh, interests that like span across not only this project, but other projects as well. So like 5G, uh, then we have one on, uh, on, uh, like zero trust and et cetera. So various different uh, topics. So here, uh, just wanted to like wrap, wrap up the, um, our, uh, conversation, uh, this afternoon. So here is our, uh, team's e email address. And then on the bottom of that is our project page. So, uh, we, at this, at this time, we'll be happy to take any uh, questions from anybody. Hey, thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, we do have some some comments and questions in the chat, so we'll we'll open up the Q and A session now. Um, if there is anything that you wanted to ask, now is the time. Uh, so we'll step through those one by one uh, for the benefit of those dialed in on the phone. I'll read those questions out loud to the presenter. Um, first things first. Um, we did get um, a question from Jess, uh, who asked about uh, the GitHub that was mentioned in the presentation. Please check the chat. Uh, Chris was kind enough to put the link uh, to their GitHub uh, within the chat. So hopefully that question has already been answered. Uh, the next question from Charles, um, how would zero trust architecture, uh, NIST publication 800-207 potentially be part of your efforts? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, as Nakia mentioned, there is a zero trust uh, project that's ongoing right now at the, uh, at the NCCOE. Um, and one of the, um, aspects that we documented in our volume B is we have a section around, uh, future, um, future efforts. And one of the things that we said in there is, uh, to put what we did into a zero trust architecture and, uh, and, uh, integrate that into the, uh, access control calculations that you make in a zero trust environment and be able to uh, take into consideration, you know, the integrity of the computing device itself. Um, as of today, um, that, uh, that integration hasn't been done yet, but, um, you know, if you, uh, if you feel that's important, you know, you can reach out, to, reach out to the team and um, they'll take it under consideration. Thank you. Um, we, we did get a, uh, a question from Shannon. She asked if this presentation is being recorded. It is being recorded. Uh, please check back to the CSI webinar announcement page. Uh, within a day or two, we'll post the link to the presentation. Uh, or you can go directly to the CSI YouTube page where we uh, post all of our digital array recorded webinars. Um, and you can see that there. Uh, Charles has a, has a follow up question. He says, "Was that publication B?" Yes. Uh, 
it's uh, vol what we call vo uh, volume B, and that's on the project page. Perfect. Uh, our next question from Eric. He says, on the artifact side, how do you ensure longevity and compatibility? Um, for example, ARM chips have different artifacts in I-86 and RISC-V. We often see system integrators use jailbreak circuits in production hardware that just becomes standard practice. Uh, if I understand the the, the answer uh, the the question correctly, um, so yeah, I, I would say that for longevity, we had that portion of the project that kind of uh, monitored the devices at um, at when they're fielded out in the field, uh, so when they're operational, and uh, that service that we used, uh, Eclipsion, kind of monitored the integrity. Uh, of the device itself. Um, I don't know if it could get down to the level that um, was relayed in the question, but um, that's generally the approach that we took um, that um, that ongoing operational uh, scan to make sure that things are um, to take heuristics from the from the computing device and make that uh, sort of risk calculation. Thank you. Um, the next question we have also for Merrick is, um, with the storage hard disk drives and solid state disk drives, we have storage match lock where the device will only boot work with a signed set of devices. Uh, the jailbreak for that is as easy as using a SATA NVMe daughter card or straight custom bootloader chip. Does Eclipsium use direct hardware connection BIOS or OS based interface to extract the info? That I definitely don't have the answer for, um, but uh, we can get you into contact with the folks at Eclipsium um, and they'll have the um, accurate information for you on, on that topic. Sounds good. Uh, next question from Chuck. He says, this work seems great, but also seems like a speck in the ocean of threats. Can you address how it scales and might grow to encompass a wider range of threats? Yes, yeah, so I can take that one. Uh, so, yeah, thanks, Chuck, for the uh, question. So, I would say that, you know, this one, I know for our work, we, we were like specific on the, uh, on the scope of work that we wanted to handle. Uh, so, I think right, right now, one thing that we have been like looking to like see is like to figure out uh, as far as like adoption to see how many people have adopted our work. Uh, and then also, we do have an option for. Uh, People uh, that that have adopted uh, that they have adopted it or not is to to tell us like what other uh, like project idea you think that we should do to help us better to be able to like a scale uh, and to like look at like other threats. I know uh, one thing that uh, you know we have have tried to do is to like uh, is try to be more proactive when it comes to like top cyber uh, challenges. Uh, and so this is right now, this document is just like one of those uh, guidance that we have uh, put out to just try to like handle some of the threats that we have heard. But if there are other ones that you think that, you know, that we should definitely try to like look into and more, we can definitely like do that. But thanks again for the question. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Jim. He says, how did this process work for mobile devices and tablets? So uh, mobile devices and tablets were, were not in scope for this for this project. Um, at the NCCOE, there is a project specifically uh, that, that focuses on mobile device security. Um, so yeah, we encourage you to, to check that one out where they cover um, so some of the some of the same issues. Um, but as Nakia uh, just mentioned, you know, we have to, we had to scope our, um, this project down into something that, you know, we could feasibly do in a, in a, in a good time period to get the best practices out. So, uh, yeah, we weren't able to cover mobile devices. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm monitoring the chat and the Q and a, I don't see any other questions. Um, as of right now, um, but 
overall, uh, I would like to thank our presenters uh, for their time today. It was a great presentation. Um, this is going to be recorded. Please check back to the CSI webinar announcement. Uh, the slides are up there right now, um, so you guys can access that. Um, they were kind enough to share uh, their project page and team email, so feel free to reach out directly uh, to the folks at NIST, uh, or if you have any questions, reach out directly to CSI. Um, as far as administrative announcements, we are implementing uh, webinar certificates for our live attendees of the webinars, so uh, look out for that uh, probably by the end of the day. Um, those webinar, those certificates are going to be based on the display name um, for that you have put into WebEx. So if you put in um, a nickname or just initials and you would like those um, updated to a full name, please reach out to us via the contact alias and we'll make sure we, we update those webinar certificates. Um, and we had a cancellation in April for the April CSI webinar. So we're making that up with two webinars in May. Uh, so we have one right after that holiday on Tuesday. Um, just please keep in mind that we'll be starting at 1230 instead of 12 noon Eastern um, for that. So hopefully we can see you there as well. Um, but with that said, I'll end today's webinar and I would like to thank our presenters one more time. Thanks so much for yeah. the invite. Thanks for having us. All right. Take care. Everyone enjoy the holiday. All right. Same to you. Bye everyone.